Good morning to you all. I'm going to speak for exactly 30 minutes and 10 minutes questions. Research in the United States shows that managers spend 70% of their time in meetings, leaving them 30% for other matters. If we could reduce meetings time, meeting times, if we could reduce meeting times to one-tenth of what they normally take, they would spend 70% of time in, 7 of time in meetings, and they would have 93% for other things. So you would get essentially three times as much manager at no extra salary. Now, can that be done? The answer is yes. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about, how it can be done. And this is by using parallel thinking and the practical way, the six hats methods, which some of you know, which reduces meeting times dramatically. ABB in Finland used to spend 30 days on their multinational project discussions, using the six hats to do it in two days. JP Morgan, the finance house in Europe, reckoned they reduced meeting times to one-tenth of what they had been. These are practical things which happen. There's some more examples I'll give you later. Now, why does this happen? Because for 2,400 years, we have used argument. Argument was invented by the GG3, GG3 being the Greek gang of three, <laughs> who of course were Socrates, with his concern with dialectic or argument, Plato, concerned with the truth. As a matter of interest, Plato did not believe in democracy at all, he thought it was a very silly system, and Aristotle with his box logic, you're in this box or you're not in the box, there's nothing else for it. Now this was made even worse because when Greek thinking came into Europe at the time of the Renaissance, schools, universities, thinking generally were in the hands of the church. They did not need creative thinking or design thinking or perceptual thinking. What they did need was truth, logic, and argument with which to prove heretics wrong. So that became the core of our thinking, truth, logic, and argument. That has been extremely useful in science and technology, but we've never actually culturally developed thinking for creating value. Individuals have to be sure, inventors, entrepreneurs, innovators, but culturally, never. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about right now. Argument has been in use for 2,400 years in government and parliament and law courts and negotiation. It's an extremely crude and primitive way of exploring a subject. A argues with B. It's negative. Consists of attack. There's fixed ideas. There's no design, but the biggest problem of all is huge exercise of ego. I think argument was developed by wealthy middle-class Greeks who had a big lunch, didn't have to work in the afternoon, they wanted some way of occupying the afternoon, and some way of showing they were smarter than their neighbors. So what could we have instead of argument? We could have parallel thinking. Imagine an overhead view of a building, and we have four people, each facing one aspect of the building, and through a mobile phone, each of them is arguing that the side of the building he or she sees is the most beautiful side of the building, and they go on arguing. Parallel thinking means, instead of arguing, they all move around here, what do we see from here? Then they all move around there, what do we see from there, then there, and then there. So parallel thinking instead of A arguing with B, A and B are looking in the same direction, but the directions vary. 
Now, in order to indicate and symbolize the direction changes, we use the notion of the hat, the thinking hat. So as you sit thinking, there are six imaginary hats you put on or take off. Now, there is a physiological reason behind this. Imagine an antelope in Africa grazing and here's a noise in the grass. Immediately there's a chemical released in the hypothalamus which sensitizes all the nerve circuits concerned with running away, fleeing uh, and so on. On the other hand, in the, so as soon as the lion appears, antelope immediately can run away. On the other hand, in the lion's brain, as soon as it sees its possible lunch, there's a chemical release which sensitizes all the neural circuits concerned with getting your lunch. So in the brain there are background chemicals which sensitize different areas. And if when you're thinking you try and do everything at once, you end up with confusion and in our habits usually end up being negative. That's the nation of argument. So instead of that we have six modes of thinking. And for each mode there is a particular hat. This is not the sequence of views, just presenting it. We have a white hat, and you think of white as paper. White hat is information. What is available, what is needed, questions, and how to get the information we need. So when the white hat is in use, everyone is focusing on information. What do we have? What do we need? How do we get it? Then there's another hat. I repeat, this is not the sequence of the use, this is just presenting them. Another hat is the red hat. You can think of red as far, warm. The red hat is feelings, emotions, intuition. You just express your feelings, your emotions, your intuition. You do not have to explain or justify it. You say, right now, I don't like that idea. Or right now, I'm uncertain. Or right now, I love it. Whatever it is, you just express it. Then we have the black hat. And you can think of black as a judge's robes. Black hat is cautious, careful, risk assessment, negative aspects, why something won't work, critical, and so on. That's our typical crit critical thinking. That doesn't work, that doesn't fit the information, and so on. Excellent hat, but clearly only part of thinking. Then we come to another hat. And that's the yellow hat. You can think of yellow as dawn, sunrise. <laughs> the yellow hat, we look for value, benefits, and even how to do it. In, a, in essence, the positive aspects. Now, what is very interesting about education is that while we teach a lot of critical sensitivity, Nowhere in education do we teach value sensitivity. And without value sensitivity, it's impossible to be creative. I've sat in on many creative meetings where they've had excellent ideas, but been unable to see the value in their own ideas. Because without value sensitivity, you can't see the value of an idea. You should be able to see the value, you may decide you don't want to use it, it's too expensive or too risky by all means, but you're able to see clearly the value. Then we have a green hat. You can think of green as vegetation, growth, energy. Green is creativity. Creativity new ideas, alternatives, 
both the obvious ones and the less obvious ones, possibilities and modifications of the idea. So when the green hat is in use, everyone makes a creative effort. If not, you keep quiet. People don't like keeping quiet, so they make a creative effort. Now, a very important aspect of creativity is possibility. And mostly in our education, we don't encourage possibility. This is particularly so in science, because science followed witchcraft, where everything was possible. Science says no more possibility. You have a hypothesis, the most reasonable hypothesis, which you support or you attack, no possibilities. And that has had a huge hindering effect on science. I'll give you a, a very simple example. There's a medical condition called peptic ulcer, which means stomach ulcer or duodenal ulcer. Unfortunate people with this condition used to be on antacids for 20 to 50 years. They might lose their stomach to surgery. They had to stay on a diet, very strict diet, know this, know that, and so on and so on. Pretty awful situation. Then a young doctor in West Australia, J.B. Marshall, thought of a possibility. He said maybe a peptic ulcer is an infection. Everyone roared the laughter, said don't be absurd. These hydrochloric acid in the stomach would kill any bacteria, it cannot possibly be an infection. Anyway, he gave himself an ulcer, eventually he proved it was an infection. As a result, instead of 20 years or 50 years in antacids or losing your stomach, or watching your diet, you just spend one week on antibiotics. One of the biggest changes in the whole of medicine. Because someone thought of possibility. Possibility thinking is not encouraged in science, unfortunately. So that's the green hat. Then we have the blue hat. The blue hat is a bit like the conductor of an orchestra. The blue hat is essentially the organizing hat. The blue hat decides what is the focus, what are we thinking about, what is the aim or the objective, what do we hope to achieve, the sequence of use of the hats, and also manages the outcome result at the end. So there we have six modes, and what of course is essential, that at any moment everyone is using the same hat. That's essential. I've had a lot of people tell me we're using the hats, and I say, how? And they say, one person is yellow hat, one person is black hat. Totally, 100% wrong. Parallel thinking means the same at any moment. It's very widely used. Last year, I was told by a Nobel Prize economist. He said the previous week he'd been in Washington. The top economic meetings in the United States, they were using the six hats. It's used by four-year-olds in school as well. Now, it's very, very widely used. And as I say, it reduces meeting times dramatically. About a month ago, I was in South Africa at a meeting of some of my trainers, and what, someone was telling me a story about a company which had been discussing a project for 18 months, unable to reach a decision. Using the hats, in one hour and 15 minutes, they had a solution, after 18 months of discussion. Then another example from New York, Ericsson had a big project, a $4 billion project. They'd been discussing for three weeks, hadn't got anywhere. They decided to invite one of my trainers and teach them the hats, and in one afternoon they had an outcome. In other words, you get very quick outcomes. Now that's surprising, because at first people say, oh, but all these hats are going to complicate things, going to take